Hello everybody and a huge welcome to webinar two in our Thriving After Massive Global Disruption series. And today we are absolutely delighted that we have the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology who are going to speak to us today about the range of different ways in which they are working to mitigate the COVID uh, crisis. So to begin with, we are delighted that um, Professor Tim Cheng, their Dean from Engineering, will do a welcome from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Then we'll introduce you to today's speakers and looking forward to a, a, a fascinating uh, hour or, or so of, of presentations and discussion from our colleagues in Hong Kong. So without further ado, um, can I hand you over to Tim, who will do the introduction, then I'll come back and do a kind of formal introduction from Strathclyde, from policy at Strathclyde, um, then we will get on with the presentations. So, Tim, can I hand over to you to say hello? Yes, to Phil, Hong Kong? thank you. Good evening from Hong Kong, and welcome you all to the webinar. Hong Kong University in Science Technology is very pleased to be the first partner to host a webinar in the University of Strathclyde Global Webinar Series on the implication and the impact of COVID-19. The pandemic is an unprecedented crisis worldwide. An outbreak since December last year has been sweeping across 216 countries and more than 4.7 million cases have been reported. As a global citizen, research teams at HKUST have been working to contribute to the coronavirus control. In this webinar, we shall share our all round efforts to fight against COVID-19 pandemic from prevention, mitigation, to treatment. To detect the virus carriers, 16 AI-based smart fever screening systems have been installed at Hong Kong borders to support the local government for temperature monitoring. Likewise, a mobile app with automated geofencing technology has been used by the government to monitor people under mandatory home quarantine. And in terms of stopping the spread of the virus, antimicrobial coating bases, air purifiers have been set up at three mainland hospitals, including Wuhan Huoshenshan Hospital and the several Hong Kong hospitals. Additionally, 50 driverless cars for grocery delivery to minimize human contacts have been deployed in mainland China and to offer a response to the development of vaccines our researchers identify a set of potential vaccine targets that trigger an immune response in the human body, which could be helpful for COVID-19 vaccine development. Universities around the world are contributing innovative ways to fight against this public health crisis. And through the academic exchange this evening, and the sharing by others in the future webinar series. We hope to have a better understanding among universities regarding our knowledge in addressing this global challenge. And I look forward to our collective and the concerted efforts in curtailing COVID-19. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Tim, for, for that introduction. Um, just to kind of run through what the, the um, order is for today's webinar, um, as I say, just on behalf of the University of Strathclyde and Policy at Strathclyde, I'm Phil Considine, I'm Director of Policy at Strathclyde, and we are absolutely delighted that we are on to webinar number two. For those of you that are watching, can we ask that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen? If you have any questions, please post them there. And then what we will do is, once we've been through all of the presentations, we will curate them and we will ask the, the panel uh, and probably the most relevant individual in the panel to pick up on some of the questions and points that you've been asking. 
the entire webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you. And the slides will be made available um, in the coming days as well. So the, the running order that we have today is we're going to start with a presentation by Professor Richard So. And Richard is a um, professor and his background is in engineering and applied science. Um, he studied at the University of Southampton and he's a professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Decision Analytics. The second presentation will come from Professor King Lun Young and his background is as a chemical and biological engineer in the Division of Environmental and Sustainability. Um, he's the founding director of the Joint Laboratory of Innovative Environmental Health Technologies. The third presentation today will come from Professor Gary Chan. And Gary is a professor in the Department of Computer Science. <clears throat> he's also a director of the Entrepreneurship Centre in the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And Gary obtained his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University and has studied at Princeton as well. And Gary's uh, research interests are around smart sensing, internet of things and mobile computing. We will follow this by a presentation by Professor Ming Liu and Ming graduated with his PhD from Zurich um, in robotics and he's a director of the Intelligent Autonomous Driving Centre at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So I think we can see what kind of impact um, the, the, the work that Ming's involved in will, will be having, particularly around social distancing and the ability to get um, groceries and medicines to, to people who are having to self-isolate. And we will finish up with a, a presentation by Matthew Mackay and Professor Matthew Mackay from the Electrical and Engineering uh, and Computer Science Department. Um, Matthew has received the Stephen Rice Prize for the Best Young Research Award um, by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And his area of interest is in transactions and wireless communication and random matrices. In 2018, he was selected as the young scientist at the World Economic Forum. So we've got a, a, a fantastically diverse uh, range of presentations today. Each one of them will last for approximately six, seven minutes, and that will leave us with plenty of time then for questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, can I pass over for the first presentation to Richard? And Right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, good evening or good morning, depends where you are. So let me share my screen first. Okay. Okay, so. Right, so the uh, topic I'm going to talk about is the uh, smart fever screening systems, uh, rapid deployment and the uh, development in six days. So, uh, Fever screening using infrared is not new. It's been around. So what's new? Uh, our system were able to detect fever suspect up to 10 meters away. Uh, it ignored non-human warm objects. Uh, it detects faces when it's very heavy occlusion because if it's 10 meters away and coming in the crowd and it's applying real-time decision analytics as well as AI. And most important of all, we got the request um, a week before the Chinese New Year. So we finish and everyone can go home for the Chinese New Year, but they couldn't come back, okay, because of the pandemic. So uh, here is a photograph in our high-speed train station. So you can see the people coming in here uh, and there is a red dot on the TV screen. And basically that is detected, somebody with fever and it was occluded by a ladies in front and, and was there. So, so that is a demonstration. So the uh, photograph on the left is the old system and the new system side by side. Um, so we do have the old system, which was manually and the operator have to look at both screen and humanly make a decision. So our system would make a recommendation. It will sound an alarm. Uh, and, and the good thing with that is in the long run, it can keep statistics, all the uh, you know, false positive type one, type two errors, and there's always room, room for further improvement. 
So the scientific issues here are we're trying to combine analytics and deep learning. In particular, uh, there is something called the visual closure, which I will explain later. And the fever detection, in order to be able to detect a fever um, at a distance of 10 meters, that again require a sophisticated algorithm. So we're very happy that we can link uh, basic research to impact. So our group has always been working on bio-inspired vision and hearing. So in bit this particular case is uh, obviously is hearing, uh, is, is vision. So human don't actually see what we see, we guess what we see. We generatively see patterns. And so we developed the bio-inspired uh, spatial temporal models. Uh, this because that's how our brain is, is consists of um, to simulate the human vision. So you can see here, um, there's a donkey and there's a dolphin, but there is not really a donkey and there's not really a dolphin, but we see that anyway. Okay, so we able to um, see in parts, but construct and perceive in whole. And that's basically called the, uh, you know, visual closure. So in here, uh, you know, the picture on the left is, you know, there's a human behind the door. We don't see it, but we know. Why? Because human has one head, two hands, a feet, and so on. So, so that is the science of anthropometry. So we combine that and also with the deep learning, uh, we were able to build in and simulate the visual closure. So on the bottom, on the left, I wear a mask. There's no, no occlusion, so clearly there's a face box. I wear middle one, I wear a mask, about 40% occlusion. On the right side, I wear a mask, I hold in a, a magazine and I own a tiny corner. In fact, even if I completely occlude my face, the algorithm will still guess. Why? Because there are shoulders, right? There are rest of it. There are whole anthropometry, but of course, if you don't see the face, I cannot detect fever or not. So we cut that out. So then the next, in addition to the visual closure, which is very helpful when you get detecting people in a very, heavily occluded situation um, is that, you know, in order to detect the temperature fever remotely, um, we have to rely on infrared. But infrared means that, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, influences and other things that we need to see. Okay, and for example, there are sunlight reflected back from our forehead. Uh, there is an air absorption by the moisture, moisture on the, in the air, uh, depending on humidity. So this whole list of analytic equations, ambient temperatures, we put it all in. But at the same time, that's not enough. We have to use deep learning. As you can see the pictures on the lower, we have to apply super resolution depending on the orientation of the human, um, you know, the, the area exposure are different. So we use that, we, we pump it into a training set. And so combined analytical and deep learning, we were able to guess, guess at 10 meters, just like human does. So with that, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, it is a teamwork. So I'm a team leader, uh, my colleagues, you know, Bert, Chi Fung, Albert are also, and that is the team that uh, work day and night, literally. I still remember that on the sixth day, I sent them off on the early train back to China. Okay, so work till four o'clock in the morning, they go back, I told them do not sleep. And then they came back and catch the six o'clock train home. Okay, so with that, I, I'll finish and I'll happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Fascinating insight there. And I think already I've got kind of quite a number of questions that um, your presentations raised. Um, what, what we will do with them is we will we'll, we'll cover all the questions at the end because I think some of them may well be actually answered and others of them will be added to with the presentations that are following. Um, so thank you very much for that, for a fascinating insight. Um, so can I now pass over to Professor Kim Long Young, who will be our next presenter. Um, and I will now just mute myself. Hi. To it, Kim Long Young. Hello. Uh, what I would like to share with you uh, today is about the smart antimicrobial technologies. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, I actually joined HKUSD back in 96. 
And in 97, unfortunately, uh, Hong Kong experienced its first avian flu outbreak. So that means to say uh, uh, the government had to cull all the uh, poultry from the market. And then six years later, uh, we had the first coronavirus uh, but, uh, epidemics, which is the SARS. And then another uh, few years, okay, we have the H1N1, okay. And in between, we have MERS, we have H7N9, okay, outbreak. And then the most recent one is the COVID-19. So we can see that large-scale infection uh, event are actually occurring in relatively regular interval and actually becoming more frequent. And beside these big events, uh, we also have to deal with, okay, growing microbial resistance and tolerance, okay? And in particular, there are growing prevalence, worldwide prevalence of AMR-related infection. So that's get me really interested to try to create technology that will not only have high efficacy, very good safety, but also will support high degree of compliance. That means to say something that is not only something that people will need to use, but also want to use and easy to use, okay? So the first uh, technology that we have actually developed is a smart antimicrobial coating, okay, in order to, to allow for prolonged, okay, disinfection of surfaces. The way that it works is like, we basically put into uh, a smart envelope, okay, a gaseous chlorine dioxide disinfectant, so that when this coating is placed on the surface, if I touch it, those areas that I touch will release more of this disinfectant to rapidly disinfect the area. The same if I got it contaminated with uh, bodily fluid, like saliva droplets, okay? And this can last for at least 30 days, okay? It, and, and when it is not being touched or contaminated, it will actually release a small amount of dis disinfectant to provide, okay, maintenance, uh, maintenance level disinfection of the surface. How does it work? Because one of the disinfectant, which is the release killing disinfectant, it's an oxidative disinfectant. It will basically, as shown here, for various viruses, H1N1, H3N2, EB71 that could ha uh, that cause hand, foot, and mouth diseases, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, okay, and adenovirus, but, which cause pink eye. So these viruses, when they got into these surfaces, they actually get oxidized. Their RNA actually get damaged. And looking at one particular influenza virus, which is the uh, H1N1, one can see that the protein, the H and N protein on the surface that cause the infection that allow it to lodge onto the cell are actually can be completely, okay, denatured and damaged within one minute, okay? So that allow you to have a very, very high, okay, efficacy using this material. And at the same time, it's very convenient because it's responding to contamination. So this is one of the technology that we actually developed over that years. Uh, the next one is actually, we are very interested because many of these virus particles are actually airborne, okay? So is it possibility for us to create an air filtration system, okay, that will also have antiviral activity? And indeed, we are successful in doing that. We have tested it uh, even to mers cov which is uh, one of the deadlier strain of coronavirus, okay? And we can attain 98.8% within one, uh, one, uh, one minute. Influenza, influenza A, influenza B, Hong Kong flu, enterovirus, and others. And it's also very effective against other respiratory type pathogens, uh, including like uh, bacteria as well as fungal, okay? And the test is not only done in our laboratory because we do have industrial partner that, uh, that help us commercialize it. So they also engage other laboratory in Japan, in US, in China, in Australia to do a lot of series of testing. Indeed, this particular air particulate filter was used in air purifier in the field hospital during this uh, recent uh, pandemic in Wuhan. Okay, so this is the technology that they actually approved for use in the field hospital because they knew that this is very uh, good in terms of like uh, disinfecting uh, viruses. And the more recent one, um, we had actually rolled out uh, another generation, okay, of uh, multi-level antimicrobial polymers 
that allow you to have a very long sustained disinfection of surfaces up to 90 days, okay? This actually act by doing contact healing, okay, as well as anti-adhesion. So it's have been tested for viruses as well as bacteria and spores, okay? And uh, in fact, this uh, technology is now being rolled out uh, uh, very broadly in Hong Kong, used in uh, elderly home, in uh, schools, uh, as well as in, in, um, in some of the palliative care uh, facilities. And the way that we are able to kind of position our technology is like in laboratory, as a researcher, we only focus on efficacy. A lot of time, we ignore many of the issues related to safety and compliance. However, with us engaging the major stakeholder, the, the healthcare providers, okay, the elderly home, the Center for Health Protection, the hospital authority, require us to focus very strongly that the material that we are going to use are indeed safe. That is the very first thing. So we have to do a barrage of safety study Simultaneously, by engaging this major stakeholder, we knew exactly what they need or what they wanted, okay? Because in ma many of the healthcare settings, it had to be very convenient. It, it might not disrupt any of their current practices for them to be able to use them. Indeed, we used them in isolation ward. Uh, the, the study lasted for eight months. In orthopedic wards for two years. In, in elderly home for one year. Everything is benchmarked against one is to 50, uh, one is to 49 bleach solution that they use for cleansing. This is what the hospital know. So after 24 hours, it's, it's still 90% better, okay, than the bleach. 72 hours is still 55% better than the bleach, and 14 days later is still better 35%. So we have been benchmarking it, and we can see the efficacy of this type of technology. So thank you very much, okay? And these are our team that have been working toward uh, creating many of these technologies. Thank you. Again, thanks very much for, for a, a, a fascinating insight. Uh, and again, I've got quite a number of questions that, that are coming through um, on your presentation and on the others. So we'll, we'll capture them all and we will kind of discuss them all at the very end. Um, Moving on, and we're now looking forward to the presentation from uh, Gary Chan, and Gary's going to be talking to us about the geofencing technology, uh, and so I'll now hand over to Gary. Hello, hi. Uh, uh, good afternoon, or uh, good morning. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to share with you our geofencing technology for home quarantine order in Hong Kong. So uh, uh, it's worthwhile to sort of uh, give a timeline of quarantine measures in Hong Kong. Um, in January 22nd, uh, uh, 2020, uh, Hong Kong is confirmed the first case of uh, COVID-19. Uh, at this time, uh, 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 the government is alerted. And on the next day, the Hong Kong government designated uh, a holiday village in Sai Kong as a quarantine center. So uh, it's is a preparation of the outbreak. Uh, two days later, in January 25th, the Hong Kong government declared the viral outbreak as an emergency, which is actually the highest warning tier in Hong Kong. So uh, the, uh, basically the city is prepared uh, for the uh, viral uh, outbreak. On February, 25th, on February 5th, uh, Hong Kong issued uh, mandatory quarantine at home or quarantine centers for all arriving from mainland China. So um, uh, basically, uh, uh, visitors who violate uh, the quarantine order uh, could face up to six months in prison and uh, US uh, 3200 fine. So uh, because of this quarantine order, the government uh, has to enforce that. Um, uh, how to check uh, whether the um, people are staying at home or not uh, is, uh, is the issue. So uh, on, uh, uh, I highlight here uh, the work we have uh, done with the governments uh, in red. On February 19th, basically around two weeks later, uh, my team and governments uh, are in discussion on developing a geofencing technology for home quarantine order. Basically, we would like to geofence our uh, home uh, confinees. 
uh, about a week later, uh, the government actually is uh, was pleased with the technology and the technology and the app developments embarks. So um, on March 2nd, Hong Kong has reached 100 confirmed cases. So uh, our actually conditions uh, uh, were quite critical at this time. So on March 9th, uh, uh, about two weeks after our app developments uh, embarked, uh, a geofencing app called Stay Home Safe developed uh, jointly with Hong Kong governments uh, and us uh, is under trial in one of the, uh, uh, you know, bridge, uh, one of the major uh, control points in Hong Kong is called Hong Kong Zhuhai, Macau Bridge. So uh, 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 basically uh, from the idea conception to the, uh, to the deployment trial, it, takes, uh, it took only two weeks. So on March 18, uh, home quarantine order for all persons arriving in Hong Kong has been enforced. So uh, uh, basically, stay home safe has been deployed in Hong Kong International Airports for all uh, 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 tourists arriving uh, from Hong Kong. On March 25th, all returning residents, regardless of points of departure, were subject to the compulsory quarantine order, uh, which require all to stay at a, at a reported quarantine premise for 14 days, uh, either at home or a hotel. So tracking devices were uh, employed to enforce the order. So, uh, uh, so the app plays an important role to relieve the uh, resource requirements in the Hong Kong uh, governments to enforce this order. By the end of March, uh, uh, more than 1,000 downloads of uh, the, the people have used the uh, Stay Home Safe. Uh, by the end of April, uh, more than 10,000 downloads of this app. So basically, the stay home safe systems consist of two components. The first one is the wristband. The wristband has to be worn by the uh, home confinees. Uh, the wristband actually is paired with the phone. The phone install our install an app, which actually is our technology, and that technology is uh, is uh, uh, is going to um, basically uh, uh, geofence the phone. So the phone in, in, in terms pair with the wristband uh, users, so uh, enhance geofence the uh, users. So uh, the, the, basically the, the system is like that. So geofence technology actually uh, uh, is referring to that confinees are only allowed to move within a designated area, either a home or a center, uh, basically for elderly, for patients, in this case is for our home confinees. Alarms will be sent to the security once they move out of the region. So it has a regional context. If you, uh, it has a boundary. If you move out the boundary, alarm will be sound. So it is a just in out decision. There's no need to know the exact location of the user. The key ideas are like that. So people may ask, why not GPS? Actually, uh, using GPS, simply using that in Hong Kong does not work. Um, the reason is that Hong Kong is a concrete forest. Um, there's a lot of buildings. The GPS signals is very weak, uh, and uh, and 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 so um, and there are many apartments which are directly connected to malls without good uh, uh, without good GPS signals. So um, basically, in Hong Kong, you can, you don't even have a GPS signals from your home uh, out to the lifts all the way down to the mall and you can stay in the mall for hours without any GPS signals. So it doesn't work. And, and furthermore, GPS signal does, does not have, uh, you know, a, a, a high information. And, uh, and uh, we also need a timeliness and, and responsiveness. If the user, uh, some GP, sometimes the GPS error can be in terms of several tens of meters. So we would like accuracy higher than that. Uh, uh, there's also privacy concern. If you are GPS, you need to have the location uh, and you, the third party may know your location. And that is actually a privacy concern for the users. So basically what we do is that we look at the phone. The phones are equipped with many sensors and uh, uh, the sensors can be in cellular, can be Wi-Fi, can be Bluetooth, can be barometer, etc. cetera. So uh, the, uh, the set of signals at home has special and unique features. Um, basically, what you, uh, what you have at home and what you have in your office have different set of signal characteristics. So we basically extract the signal uh, features and learn it over time. Uh, and uh, then we are able to sort of learn this, your home signals. If your home, if your in-home signals collected by your phone is very different from the out-home signals, then we know that you are actually 
outside the region, outside the boundary. So that achieve timely in-out decision and also work in both outdoor and indoor environment. And, uh, and also the better, uh, it also have uh, better uh, privacy uh, because it doesn't need to rely on GPS. So this is the schematic, the geofencing systems. Uh, first of all, you have a phone, that, uh, that phone install the app, so as the phone is geofenced at your home. That phone pair with, your, uh, with a wristband. That wristband cannot be cut. When it is cut, uh, then the pairing will be, uh, will be detected by the phone. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if the user, uh, if the user takes the phone out of the quarantine place, um, alarm will alert will be uh, uh, will be gone to the security. Uh, if the um, if the uh, home confinee run away from the place, the pairing will, will be absent, and the phone will also alert the security. So uh, the phone basically alert if it itself is taken out of the quarantine place, or the phone detects no BLE signals from the confinee. So if the confinee cut the wristband, then the, uh, then the signal will be broken, right? The phone will then inform the security. So in this case, it protects the uh, user privacy because the users um, uh, uh, does not need to report their location continuously to the security center. Uh, it, only re it only alert the security center when it's outside the boundary. So this is, uh, this is my team actually are working on it in, in uh, two to three weeks time. We basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, make the app and then, and then deploy it uh, in, uh, in reality. Okay, uh, so uh, that basically concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Gary, yeah, many thanks. That was a, a, a very timely uh, as well um, intervention as we all around the world talk about how we might manage the, to move away from lockdown and what the options are for it. So a, a very timely uh, and contemporary one. Um, Fantastic. So can I now hand over to Professor Ming Lu, who will give us the next presentation, um, which is her the penultimate one. We're getting through these you know, this, uh, interesting presentations and time's flying. So I will hand over and look forward to, to Ming's. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay, can you see the screen and... Hello? Uh, shall I continue? Yes, Ming, Ming, no, Ming we, can, we, can, we can hear and okay. see. It's all coming across okay. very clearly. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, today my talk will be the autonomous driving uh, in low speed scenarios for the mitigation for this COVID-19 uh, situation and personally from the Intelligent Autonomous Driving Center of uh, Hong Kong ST. Um, so basically this topic is uh, about autonomous system research and development. And we talk about these uh, autonomous vehicles. Actually, uh, the first idea probably uh, jumped on my mind is that uh, it's actually a difficult task to, to do because we need to uh, face uh, so complex situations. Uh, actually, for our uh, normal research in the uh, uh, autonomous driving, we need to deal with huge amount of data and uh, dealing with the so-called from mapping, planning, to perception, uh, these uh, three phases of uh, uh, technology. And if you want to see more of our research outcome, you can go to our web, uh, web uh, website of our lab, ramlab.com uh, research. Uh, so every year we, about, we have about uh, 40 to, uh, to 60 publications. And so actually uh, what's, what we uh, have uh, been experiencing is uh, the autonomous driving uh, technology is not only a technology that we need to showcase, it's also some technology we need to uh, maintain the, uh, also we need to consider sustainability, the, the robustness and the reliability, especially when you have a vehicle driving on the road uh, the liability is also something we need to consider. So uh, we have been uh, testing uh, the platforms uh, all across uh, uh, the China uh, area, uh, range from the very low temperature to a snowing situation to the night situation, and from the typhoon uh, weather uh, to the clean day uh, situation. 
and also including the complex dynamics uh, situation, like the, the one shown on the lower left corner. Uh, so all the, the challenging uh, scenarios enable us to have the confidence that we can actually use the actually can use autonomous driving technology for something good. Uh, so during the uh, the COVID uh, period. Uh, we have been uh, deploying uh, uh, many vehicles uh, introduced by a team as well. So uh, we have several kinds of vehicles, including the, uh, some golf carts. Uh, we have something running in, in Huawei uh, Industrial Park, and also for some government uh, demonstration. Also, we have fleets of uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Also, we have some auto vehicles for advertising. And also, we have some mini uh, size autonomous vehicle. And for COVID uh, period, what is more important is that this contactless uh, delivery, uh, we have been collaborating with the uh, SF uh, Express and also with some local governments, we use um, the disinfection uh, the, the fun uh, functionality uh, to mount uh, the sprayer uh, on top of, also on the bottom of the, the vehicle so that we help the, the, the disinfection uh, of the environment. Uh, other vehicles, I, I want to go through them uh, one by one. So uh, when we apply the uh, the vehicle uh, to uh, practice, the overall procedure looks like this. So you uh, we provide something like a Uber or, or DD application that you can uh, set on uh, some on-call service uh, that, that you need some vehicle from point A to point B. Uh, also, uh, another, another application is uh, this um, uh, the, the, the disinfection uh, functionality, right? In that case, we have some looped uh, roads so that this vehicle can go continuously uh, around buildings and uh, on the roads. So after that, so we have some loading and then the autonomous vehicle will drive itself uh, in uh, all kinds of uh, complex environment. So supported by this uh, uh, cloud uh, backend, uh, we have managing uh, system uh, that uh, you can select uh, all the vehicles, whichever vehicles that's running, and you can see the uh, the, the real in life, uh, in time, uh, in situ, uh, video, uh, audio, and also uh, you can even put some remote driving orders uh, from these uh, remote uh, remote driving uh, stations when they are uh, necessary. Um, so this uh, whole entire procedure is uh, is managed as also that's the contactless. Uh, and that makes the contact is delivery possible. So um, in this uh, COVID uh, mitigation procedure, we have been reported also by uh, many of these um, uh, media. For example, uh, we, we provide the, the meal delivery from the breakfast to dinner uh, every day. And we serve that for over one and a half months uh, in, in Shenzhen. And now the situation in Shenzhen is much better. So we just uh, removed that service. Also, uh, you see, this is uh, the, the starting of February, and also we have the vegetable delivery. Uh, go to this vehicle was uh, served uh, 16 uh, villages uh, in the Shandong uh, province of China, and that's the typical vehicle we will go through. And you see, uh, that's the vehicle uh, with the dis dis disinfection on the road, and that's where we're serving the hospital area in, in Shenzhen uh, Longhua uh, Hospital. And our work has also been reported by IEEE Spectrum. If you want uh, to know more detail, you can also check the IEEE Spectrum uh, uh, journal. And also reported by uh, several other media, uh, like this uh, tech news, etc. And here is a quick summary. Uh, that's a summary up to the uh, mid of, uh, uh, sorry, the end of March. Uh, we, we already set up these uh, application scenarios with uh, given distances and time, possible time duration and the payload of the vehicle we, we, we spend and uh, the typical environments and uh, the characteristics, etc. So recently we also uh, trying to submit a paper as a summary for this part of work. And uh, finally, uh, everything we finish uh, concluded by uh, a quick video. In this video, you can see that how the vehicle uh, moving uh, in the public road during the COVID uh, period. And so the, when, the launch is, uh, when the launch box boxes uh, sent to the, the, the sent, sent to in place, and then uh, the workers uh, for the checkpoint uh, will take the launch and then the vehicle can go to the next point. Uh, of course, this vehicle will consider all the traffic rules and obey 
the uh, some social com compatible uh, the traffic uh, behaviors. Okay. So um, I think um, in general, the autonomous vehicle uh, autonomous vehicle uh, technology can greatly uh, support the uh, uh, the mitigation of the procedure of these uh, COVID, not only COVID, but then maybe all kinds of uh, necessary uh, scenario that needs this contact based delivery. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, that's all I want to want to say. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mingyu. That was uh, another great presentation. And um, I think for those of us that love our cars, we always look at autonomous vehicles with a sense of slight dread that <laughs> our, our cars will, will no longer be as important as they once were. Um, we are now moving on to the, the final presentation for today, and that's from Professor Matthew Mackay, um, who will give the the, 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 the last presentation, and then it will give us a bit of time for some questions and answers. And uh, Matthew has been looking at uh, vaccines, so the, the, the very kind of hot topic, certainly in the UK, of uh, vaccines for uh, COVID-19. So I'll pass over to Matthew. Just so that you know, Matthew, you're still on mute. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk and thanks to the other speakers. So I'm just going to share some of the work that we've done, and particularly some of the early work that we did related to COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, in particular, we were uh, interested in um, trying to help design the vaccines uh, at the early stages. So this is some work that we had published earlier on with um, my uh, PhD student um, Faraz and, and postdoc Ahmed. Um, okay, so so just for, for those of you who, who don't know, um, although many of you I'm sure will, the, um, the virus that causes the, the, the COVID-19 disease is, is, is called SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, now this is the third, of course, the third coronavirus that's um, sort of jumped to humans in, in uh, the past um, few decades, with the other two being SARS and MERS. Um, but the numbers are, are, are very different when you look at infections, when you look at the death, um, the overall deaths, we're talking orders of magnitude, which is really astounding when you think of how, you know, how uh, it's only been a few months and, and we're already at these numbers and, and um, you know, they're growing every day. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really astounding. Um, now, uh, the number of deaths is, is, is as of today, already over 300,000, um, despite the fact that the case fatality rate is quite a bit lower than um, some of like MERS and SARS. Um, okay, so now it's, um, it's becoming very clear, uh, I think, to the whole world um, that uh, this virus is not going away in a hurry. Um, and uh, things like social distancing and masks and so on seem to be helping a lot, but uh, in order for to really suppress the virus or the disease or to hopefully get rid of it, uh, it seems like a, a vaccine is going to be really um, very, <clears throat> very, very important. Um, so we started working on this very early. So actually, the mid-January, just after the first sequences got deposited, we actually started working on on this problem. And, and the problem was to you know, once we have these sequences, can we use them to somehow design the vaccine or provide some um, recommendations for vaccine targets? And what I mean by that is, can we identify those parts of the virus, those fragments, which might actually be able to elicit some uh, trigger an immune response in, in humans against this new virus? Uh, so we've been working in a group on problems related to this for a while, and in particular for other, other diseases like HIV and hepatitis C and dengue. Um, but you know, this was a whole new challenge because uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is uh, a virus that we'd never seen before. Uh, we didn't know much about its um, biology, let alone how the immune system responds to it. So, you know, particularly in the early, early times, there wasn't a lot to work with. Um, so what we did was, um, well, what we did have was sequences, and this has been a, a, a massive effort that 
people around the world have been uh, involved with, and that is by sequencing the viruses. So from, from COVID infected patients, um, you know, various labs, many labs are actually then sequencing, taking full length, the full length genome of viruses in these patients and depositing them into databases. And in particular, one of the, one of the, the main ones is, is this GISAID. Um, and this shows you how much data we've collected. And so in the, when we started on this, you know, in our initial study that I'm reporting here, we only had about 120 sequences by the end of, near the end of Feb. But you look at the curve and as of today, um, the data that we've been analyzing now is uh, approaching 20,000. So it's just, it, it's phenomenal that the, the data sharing efforts are <coughs> efforts around the world. Um, so how can we use this sequence information and particularly even in the early times to, to help come up with vaccine design recommendations. Well, the idea that we had was to look at the SARS, the earlier SARS virus in 2003. And in particular, if you look at the genetic similarity between SARS and SARS-CoV-2, you'll see that, you know, for, these are just for a number of important proteins, that there's quite a high genetic similarity, you know, up to say 90, 90% or even a bit higher. So the question is, can we exploit this genetic similarity uh, and things that we know about SARS to help give recommendations for this new SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so that was the basic idea was to actually exploit the fact that many researchers had actually been working on vaccines for SARS and learned a lot about the immune responses for SARS um, to, pro to understand what were the, you know, what were the, what were the parts of SARS that triggered the immune response. And, use that information together with SARS-CoV-2 sequence information to provide vaccine target recommendations for SARS-CoV-2. So more specifically, what people had done, many researchers had done is they'd studied SARS-infected patients, um, but running many experiments and looking at the immune responses in these patients, and particularly those that recovered, and they worked out that there are a bunch of what they called epitopes, and they just think of these as protein fragments, which have been shown to trigger immune responses, which can be in often cases protective. So the question was, you know, are these pieces which were sort of protective, or at least could, could trigger an immune response in SARS, are any of these pieces at least genetically similar? Is there some similarity when we look at the genetic sequences for the new virus, SARS-CoV-2? We expect there is some, but how much? So that was really the, the, the idea was very simple, was just can we search for these SARS epitopes uh, and see if we can identify among the SARS-CoV-2 sequences those which have a close genetic match. Um, so actually when we did this, we found that um, about 20% overall of the SARS epitope had not only a close genetic match, it had an exact genetic match in all of the sequences that we had, right? So in other words, at the genetic level, the, for these epitopes, the two viruses are, are, are identical. So we believe that these are promising targets for um, you know, for, for, for using as a, as a starting point to help to design vaccines which, which trigger a desired immune response. So this is pictorially showing, a quick video showing the, the SARS spike protein on the outside and in red are these particular uh, epitopes that we had, we had identified which were genetically conserved across the two viruses and which were associated with, um, with, with uh, eliciting an immune response in SARS. And for the, there are two branches here, I won't go through the details, but T cell, T cell and B cell epitopes. Now for the T cell case, we could actually um, show, we did a population coverage analysis and predicted that these epitopes that we found could potentially have quite high coverage in the, in, in, in the population. All right, so that was early. And um, when we did this, um, it was, uh, so, so basically there's, there's been a bunch of work done now, a lot of people working on vaccines that everyone's heard about in the news. Um, and we're starting to learn about real immune responses in, co in, in, in COVID patients. And we've, there's some evidence to show now that the antibodies and so on that are actually, SARS antibodies might actually cross-react and, and neutralize this new virus, and particularly those which actually target those regions that are genetically uh, very similar as, as the analysis would predict. Uh, there's also starting to be work done on the T cell side, but this is now very, very recent. This paper here was only, only, only last week and it's, um, you know, we're just starting to learn about this. Um, so on, on the other hand, the, we're getting a lot more data and we're getting more genetic variation in the data, which means that we are 
um, uh, you know, the vaccine target recommendations might change. So we've actually developed software to which, which kind of real time keeps track of this data and updates our recommendations. Um, and just finally, this is the work that was published. So we started this mid-January. Mid -January, we put up the preprint on the 4th of Feb and it was published on the 25th of Feb. It's been viewed quite extensively, I think getting close to 50,000 views now. Uh, and it was in the cover, uh, cover article of the viruses and, and reported into the media. And I'll just finish by saying that there are, it's a lot of work done in vaccines now. It's one of, it's a really, really um, important problem. And for those of you who are interested, I would just highlight these three reviews for those who would like to know what the current status is in the vaccine space. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, we are we, we have some time now for some questions, and, and there have been uh, lots and lots that have been coming through. Some of them are kind of uh, are not present presenter specific. Um, some of them are. So what we'll maybe do is I'll have uh, I'll go through and I'll pick out some of the the broader questions um, that will focus perhaps on one presenter, but um, that will allow others to bring in a point. And then what we will do is we, we won't have time to get through all of them. So what we'll do is we will gather them together in kind of themes and then we'll send them through and so that we can get responses to them. And then we'll make all of the responses available via the, the partner institutions, if that works for the panel. Um, so. If I can start then, I've got one question here which um, has been asked by quite a number of people. It, it came up uh, during, Richard, during your presentation where they were asking, it, it, it was around kind of things like herd immunity, but, but actually the, the, the question that came up most regularly was that many of the people who are infected don't show any fever at the early stages of, of their infection. So is fever detection at borders still an effective way of, of dealing with this? And it's a bit, I think we, we see more and more, we're seeing it in the UK where we're talking now about um, putting people into quarantine that arrive, but also we can see, I think, with this broader um, uh, application where we are starting to talk about, you know, for those of us that, that are interested in sport, um, is this how a, a a uh, way of, of us kind of uh, quickening, uh, moving out of lockdown. So just to get your thoughts on that one, Richard, is that? Yes, um, I think it's a good question. I mean, there, there's actually a study saying about 46% of COVID-19 um, carrier, okay, or infected traveler, that uh, when they cross a border, they'll, they'll actually don't exhibit uh, fever. So that's that is uh, that's true. Unfortunately, that's how I mean, unlike SARS, um, that's how we make this uh, virus so vicious. Um, I think we 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 uh, I think we actually are currently upgrading it. Um, um, again, bioinspire. So we are uh, credit to my partner Bird. Uh, that uh, he 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 we have algorithm. He actually has algorithm. Just want a uh, you know a kind of like a negative emotional facial uh, you know detection challenge. Uh, but in addition to that, we also because uh, our visual closer look at the whole anthropometry. So we actually develop algorithm to uh, detect avoidance uh, behavior. People basically look away from my camera. Um, you know, and then people wash their face with cold water. I mean, because I detect body temperature, so it is impossible to have somebody at 20 degree um, all the way through, you know, uh, something like that. Um, and, 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 and so, so yes, if there is somebody completely asymptomatic, uh, yes, then I have to admit uh, defeat. I mean, there's, a camera can't see that. Uh, unless, I don't know, you know, Matthew, you can have some fluorescent material that spray and change color and I have a, I have a laser or whatever to tag. Otherwise, there's nothing visual eyes can do. But being by Inspire, I, we, it's interesting we deploy in the border and we talk to people 
and people are very smart. So, so they don't just rely on uh, operator, don't just rely on thermal. They use their eye and they, they see uh, this guy is walking so slowly normally mm -hmm. and that guy is a little bit shaking. So, so we are kind of upgrading that. Uh, so that, that, that is a, that's a true question. An interesting thing, I mean, now that we have the system, we actually find when you have chili, you, f you turn red. Okay, that is for real. <laughs> we have uh, our uh, colleagues who know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have a system in, in, in LSK and, and so you get the very hot uh, 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 sandwiches and you turn red afterwards. <laughs> so, so it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I'm just kind of on the back of that, I think there's a question here that I'm guessing has come from a sports fan um, in the audience who's looking at uh, your work and thinking perhaps this could ease the, the, the transition back to, to some of our bigger sporting events, but they're asking how large a crowd can one device analyze? Well, it, it's about 100, but that's, that's basically how many people can pack within the field of view yeah. uh, and within the 10 meters. Um, theoretically, go higher if we have just change the CP, CPU, okay, or change the camera um, is, is, is algorithm. So it's a, it's a matter of slower and faster, slower frame rate, but typically, uh, currently, it's, it's about 100. Right. I think that, um, that, that will send a, a feeling of disappointment through those of us who were hoping that the Premier League football season would be able to restart oh. on the back of your work, Richard. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Uh, so we've got a, a question now that I think probably is um, focused more on um, King, King Lun Yung's work that, that, that he's been doing. But it's asking how, how far from large scale commercialization of the viral particulate filters um, for use in all sorts of care sectors? Is, are we kind of getting close to that? Uh, all three technology that uh, I'm, I had introduced, they are actually commercial products. So they are already being sold. Uh, like for example, the air uh, particulate filter is not only sold in Asia, but also in, in Europe, as well as in the US under different like uh, brand name, okay? Right, okay. Well, in fact, funny enough, there is a question that's come in from somebody who's obviously doing research in this area. And they've asked if it would be possible to kind of be put in contact with you directly. So what, what we'll do with that is we will, yeah, if um, I should be able to pick up from the, the Q&A who the question came from. But if you, if not, if you want to email us directly, and we'll put you directly in touch with um, HKUSD. That, that will allow you to, to um, develop the, your research further. Um, and what what... Just when we're talking about developing these um, anti antimicrobial systems, what, what are the most important factors in the development? Uh, actually, the most important factor is safety. Okay, that's number one. Uh, so for anything that you develop, uh, efficacy for us is like the secondary. Uh, safety is the most important uh, issue that we need to first tackle because this is something that you wanted to use uh, for uh, health. So it should not be... Uh, it should not cause any damage to health nor to the environment. So a lot of time uh, in terms of selection of candidate material, we have to go through very meticulous uh, process of uh, selection. Uh, secondly, we have to do a lot of like uh, safety testing because when you impose safety at the very beginning, actually it's much easier for you to later on develop the product or material that you had, okay, rather than doing it the other way around, okay. And secondly, uh, what we also find out is like the, not the need of the user, but what they wanted is very, very critical issue. So whatever, pro, uh, whatever technology that you develop, if they don't want it, nobody's gonna use it, okay? So that is very important. So engaging a stakeholder at the very, very early stage of developing a, uh, a technology is very, very critical. Because a lot of time academic may do something in the lab, they think this is the best way to do it. But in reality, from the stakeholder point of view, this could be totally 
something not possible, okay, because of various constraints uh, beyond technical feasibility, okay, so. Perfect, thanks for that, thanks for that uh, clarification uh, and for those additional points. Um, moving on, I, we've got a couple of questions here for Gary and the, the, I'm sure that this won't surprise you, Gary, the, the, the question of um, privacy has come up from a couple of people. Um, I, so what are the major challenges that you find in deploying the system? And are, are, are privacy rights part of that? Or do, they, uh, do people kind of, are, are they accepting just now that actually we, we need to change our perceptions on things like privacy? You're on mute, Gary. <laughs> All right, sorry. Okay, now, so basically, uh, this home quarantine order is to make sure that um, people stay at home uh, for those who are uh, going through this uh, confinement. So um, the, uh, the government or the, uh, the police would like to know whether the person is at home or not, whether he's in home or out of home. So uh, when you, uh, so there's no what we call Privacy. The reason is that they just want to make sure that you are at home. So uh, this um, this uh, technology, geofence technology, is just serving that. If the person is at home, there will not be any alarm. So basically, if you are at home, uh, the police will not will not come to you, right? But if you are out of home, then the police will be alerted. So they will come and then sort of trying trying to understand what is going on. So uh, so it's an in out decision. Mm. Um, so, so basically, the government was basically wants to make sure that you are at home. So, without this technology, uh, normally what they do is that the police will come to your home once in a while at random time to knock on your door to make sure that you are at home. So, uh, that, this is one way of doing that. But technology is able to streamline the whole process yeah. and to save lots of resources to in monitoring that. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Okay, and so moving on then to um, so Ming Yu, we've got quite a number of questions that have come up on the autonomous vehicles. Um, I think that we have um, you know, people are asking about what you think the role of autonomous vehicles might be after uh, the pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, how how do you how do they avoid um, accidents uh, and do they have uh, a system in place that will ensure that the overriding factor is that they don't uh, injure pedestrians? I think the uh, autonomous vehicle um, itself. This topic will be keep on uh, undergoing the discussing for the next uh, maybe twenty to thirty years. And this will not be um, uh, some technology. We will um, receive the the complete version by tomorrow. Uh, it's still um, many um, uh, a quite a long way to go. Mm -hmm. That that that's the current situation. So for the uh, COVID uh, situation, um, I think uh, it actually provides some kind of stage. So on this stage, uh, actually we can. Uh, easily, um, not not easily, but we can uh, fully um, disclose what the autonomous vehicle can help, especially for this contactless operations of the delivery, etc. And after the uh, pandemic, uh, I think uh, basically we are also doing the autonomous vehicle for the industrial uh, parks, and also we have these uh, uh, golf carts uh, like autonomous vehicle that can serve for other purposes. So uh, for these low speed uh, autonomous vehicle in mm. these uh, confined areas, I think um, the uh, firstly, the market is already there. Secondly, the technology is mature enough to support this kind of uh, applications. Uh, it's much better than a better situation than, uh, for example, the uh, robot taxi on the public road or um, these uh, um, arbitrary A to B navigation uh, just go through all the highway, then uh, urban environments, and then country road. I think the for the complete uh, autonomous vehicle system, that's still far away. But for these uh, um, uh, dedicated dedicated applications, like in the uh, confined areas, uh, this already uh, uh, is there. 
Okay. Yeah, and I think that as well some of the research that, that that we can see shows very clearly that there are actually less accidents with um, autonomous self-driving vehicles than there are with people behind the wheel. So um, I, I think that we could see a, a drop in accidents rather than an increase in them. Okay, I have got a couple of questions here. I, I, this one, Matthew, was um, came out after your presentation, and I think this is probably the easiest question that anybody is going to get um, today, which is, when will the vaccine be ready, and how effective will it be? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's that easy, to be honest. <laughs> It's a million dollar question. I think everybody is sitting on the edge of their chairs hoping you're going to say, oh, in about six weeks, and it will be 100%. No, no I, I think that there's no chance of that. Okay, so I think that's an easy question to answer. I mean, that's easy, but I think it's, um, you know, the, the reason it's not easy to answer is because these early stages and people are actually trialing so many things, right? There's actually a number of vaccines that are being trialed, including some very high profile ones you've probably heard about, that these technologies have never been you know, in a human licensed vaccine before, right? So um, mm -hmm. things like DNA and RNA vaccines. And so, on. so it's, um, but they're really promising. And I think that um, this speed, normally vaccines take, you know, 10 years to develop, right? So this is already, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, there's a chance by the end of this year or maybe 18 months or so, but this is, uh, you know, the, the thing to understand is it does take a lot of time and care to actually develop vaccines. And it's not just, there's no, very likely, I think we're not just going to have one vaccine. I think that there'll probably be multiple, um, maybe with different technologies. And I think that the current, what's current coming out at the moment, including reports today in the news from Moderna, um, was, you know, they're quite promising in terms of the different technologies. There's a number that are in phase one clinical trials now. And I think that um, you know, there's good reason to expect that we're gonna have a number of candidates that are gonna be quite successful in terms of eliciting a, an immune response, but you know, safety is, a, is a really an issue that we need to be, take care of and we need to spend a significant time to, to resolve that. And also things like immunity, you know, it doesn't last forever. So in SARS, yeah. some of the responses to SARS, um, antibodies didn't last that long. So yeah. to test that, you need time. So there's a number of reasons that, you know, I would say the end of this year would be lucky, but it's possible maybe, but I think it's probably, a, you know, when people are talking a year to 80 months, I think it's yeah. probably um, yeah. reasonable. Yeah, uh, and I think that's kind of in line with what um, is coming out from most of the, uh, of the commentators as well that are suggesting that those sorts of time skills. Have, there ever, have we ever found a vaccine for a COVID well, virus in the past successfully? Right. So, yeah, so, so we've never, there's no licensed vaccine for any coronavirus in humans. Um, the, with SARS, there was a number which were very promising um, uh, using various technologies that, they, that I think have actually really stimulated a lot of the work now for, and really helped to, to accelerate the current efforts. Um, there was, I think, two that made it through clinical, uh, phase one clinical trials. One was a DNA vaccine, I think, and I think one was an inactivated vaccine, and both of them seemed to be quite promising. So, but, but in the end, they were not needed. So funding went away, the push for them went away, and then, you know, uh, 15 years later, we uh, we might actually really <laughs> use a lot of that information that we learned to, to really help now. And I think it also tells us that these things will probably come back in the future and it's time to invest in, start thinking more broadly about not just this thing, but actually learn from this and hopefully start to protect against ones in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant, thanks. Okay, I think that probably we've, we've, we've kept as close to time as I think um, what we had hoped. So um, I, I will finish just by saying a huge thank you to everybody um, who's contributed today to not just the presenters, but also to the teams of people that sit behind them and who are um, leading a, a lot of the, the technology uh, and um, engineering and science behind the the fight against COVID. Um, next week, we move to not quite the opposite end of the world, but not far off. 
um, where we go to the University of Waterloo in Canada, where we will have Professor Besima Momani talking about the economic and political challenges that we're facing. Um, we've seen today in the UK, and we saw it in the States and across the world, we're seeing massive rises in unemployment. I think that there's, there doesn't seem to be any um, dissent from the fact that we're clearly heading towards uh, uh, some sort of global recession. It's just a question of how big it will be. So we'll be picking up on some of the questions around that next week. Um, again, thank you to everybody from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for some outstandingly insightful presentations. And we will make sure that the questions are all gathered up. We will put them to everybody just to get the answers so that we can then, for the ones that we didn't get a chance to, to, to do today, um, and we'll post them so that everybody can see what the, the, the panel's thoughts are. And this will be a, this webinar will be available um, within 24 hours. We will send everybody that's been on a, a link so that you can watch some or all of it again. So a huge thank you to our panel and a massive thanks to all of the participants. From We've got people from <clears throat> across the globe, from Europe, from Middle East, from Africa, I'm just looking at the lists, um, from US, from North America, South America, so we'll, we'll get a genuine global audience and obviously lots of people that are dialed in today from the Far East and from Hong Kong. So a uh, very good evening to you, um, to those of you in Europe, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and to people in North America, enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. <laughs>